Pro program, Dr. Manners. Let me know, did I miss anything, crew? Because I'm, play I'm, I'm dependent on y'all, <laughs> okay? Are you passing around that sheet to make any corrections? I can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. um, some of you have seen the, the uh, YouTube video that I have posted on my personal site about pruning. I've modified that a little bit for today. Uh, to be specific more to us in the yeah. Lakeland, Tampa area. Um, and and so it's it's mostly the same video but with some additions and some slight changes. So anyway, um, that's what we're gonna do here. Hi, I'm Malcolm Manners. I am a professor of horticulture at Florida Southern College in Lakeland, Florida. Behind me, uh, my background here is Ruth's Rose Garden on our campus. It has about 300 rose bushes of many different horticultural classes. Many of them are antique or heirloom types. And um, we prune this garden every year. Uh, for one thing, it tends to get too big. And when the roses are above your head and you can't see them anymore, that's not good. And it's just good horticultural practice. So uh, they're almost all grafted to Fortuniana rootstock. That is a very good root system for Florida, but it also promotes the plant becoming extraordinarily large. And so uh, in the spring, usually in the second half of February, we prune this garden. And what I wanna to demonstrate today is some of the techniques we use. Now for each group of plants, we'll use a slightly different technique with a slightly different outcome. So what I'm gonna to demonstrate today, first off is a pretty typical hybrid tea. That's the usual modern cut flower type rose that most people grow. And then I'm gonna follow that up with a true old fashioned tea rose, which is not the same as a hybrid tea. And we prune them to be a much larger size when we're done. So that's what I wanna to demonstrate today on this video. We look at some of the pruning equipment that we tend to use when we prune our roses. Uh, there are good tools and also not so good tools that you might use. So this is a known as a, a bypass clipper. Um, it has two blades, almost like blades on scissors. They're both reasonably sharp. And so both of them cut through the stem. Those are perfectly good for cutting marigolds or zinnias or something soft like that that you might be cutting as cut flowers. But if you're pruning your roses, they really don't make a very good cut. It's the, the, the stem tends to slip out of them. And even if you do manage to make the cut with them, it's just not gonna be a good clean cut. So I don't recommend that style. Then there's what's known as an anvil cut uh, clipper. In that case, the, um, let's see if I can get my cursor on here. No, it's not gonna let me. Um, the top blade there is the sharp blade that does the cutting. And then at the bottom is just a flat part known as the anvil. And what you can't see here is when you push those together, the blade goes onto the surface of the anvil. It does not go past it. Past it. So there it is almost closed. And when you do that, the blade side makes a nice clean cut. But at the same time, that anvil pushing on the other side of the stem is bruising it. So most of the time, you really don't get a good clean cut when you use one of these. And I don't know why they even sell them. Uh, they're some of the most common ones you'll see in places like Lowe's and Walmart. And yet it's really not an appropriate clipper for any use ever. The ideal type then would be what's known as an anvil bypass. This one also has a sharp blade. In this case, it's on the bottom front where we're looking at it. But it also has an anvil, which is that darker one that's just stained uh, that goes behind it. But importantly, when you close that, the blade goes past the anvil. Again, almost like the uh, blades and the scissors. But in this case, on this side, that blade is making a nice clean cut with no bruising from the anvil. And on the other side, the anvil may be uh, creating a bruise. But if you turn your clipper the correct way, um, we're gonna throw that part of the cane away anyway, so who cares? So here it is open. And then when you squeeze that 
the way it's oriented right now, the blade's going to go behind that anvil. Just another view of the same thing with the blade on the bottom side. Then a um, long-handled version of the same thing, known as a lopper or a lopping shear, you can also get those with the anvil bypass or the anvil-type blades. And again, I would always choose the anvil bypass. And then for really big stuff, you might want to use a pruning saw. And uh, we happen to use Felco's, but Corona makes a good one. There are a number of good types of pruning saws that you could also use for really big canes. Here are some close-up shots of, of how to make the correct cuts on the cane. This cane has been injured by chili thrips, an insect pest that we have here. That's all the silvery damage on the on the uh, uh, bark. Um, notice right where that leaf is attached, there is a little pink dot just above it. That is the bud. That's what we're always going to cut to, and that's where the new stem is going to come out. On the left there, the other arrow is pointing to a prickle, often referred to as a thorn. Um, I have seen people who were just learning to prune that cut back to one of those. Don't do that. That prickle will never grow into another stem. And what you'll be left with then is an inch and a half of just, just stem that won't grow going from there over on the right to where the actual bud is. The bud is what will grow. Well, by having that stub there, it will eventually die and then it may rot back and you may lose the cane because of it. On your clippers, notice how these clippers are turned. The arrow is pointing toward the sharp blade of the clipper. And then the other side is known as the anvil, and it's not sharp, it's much thicker. Notice that this clipper is turned in such a way that when those cross each other, like the blades of a scissors, the blade is going to be on the side that faces that bud, and therefore, um, on a bush, this is kind of sideways, but the root system of that bush is off to the right. The top part that I'm going to throw away is off to the left. So I want that sharp blade on the side that faces the root system, the part I'm going to keep. That's going to make a much cleaner cut. On the back side where that anvil goes, goes, it's going to bruise the stem. Well, I'm going to throw that stem in the trash, so I don't care about that. But what, I, what is left on the bush, I want to be a nice, smooth, clean cut. I'm also going to try to cut it at about a 45 degree angle with that dormant bud above the leaf on the side where the angle goes the highest. And so it kind of slants down behind it. The, the back side of that cut may not be right level with the bud, but it'll be close, close to that. You don't want to get much closer to the bud than that. That's maybe oh, more than an eighth, but not more than a quarter of an inch above the bud. If you leave it too long, as I said earlier, you're going to have a stub that dies back. If you get it too close, you might injure the bud itself. So this is a good, a good distance. Along a cane, you're going to choose which bud you cut to based on several things. First off, how tall do you want the bush to be? And, and by cutting to various buds, um, you can make it taller or lower. Uh, but the other thing to consider is what direction does it aim? So here where I've made this cut, that next stem is going to come out kind of toward us slightly to the left. Had I cut above the bud on that leaf below it that goes off to the right, the new stem would have headed off to the right side. Uh, and by choosing that, I can kind of determine where uh, that angular new branch is going to go, which is important if it's right out next to a walkway where I don't want the new branch reaching out to get me. Um, also notice that the leaf under that has five leaflets. That's the common number for most roses. Some roses will have seven, some only make three. But in general, if you cut somewhere near the middle of a cane where you have the maximum number of leaflets for that particular variety, you'll get a stronger new growth coming out than if you cut it way up toward the flower where you may be down to only three or even one leaflet, or if you cut it at the very base where you only have one or three leaflets. Cutting in the middle of a, of a growth flush of the stem is usually advantageous. Uh, this is one of those areas where I'm going to be talking about where you have what we call twiggy growth, where there are too many little stems 
that aren't really worth much. They're not making big stems. They're not making big flowers. So what I'm going to do here is leave the one that faces left and the one that faces right. And I'm going to move, remove the two thinner ones in the middle. So there, that's been done. That's going to give me much better growth out of that plant than I would have had had I left all four of those. This is the old hybrid tea rose piece, probably one of the most famous and popular roses of the last century. Um, it's typical of a hybrid tea, and, uh, which is what most modern cut flower type roses are. And so in this case, what we want is a plant that's kind of vase shaped. And if you were farther north, you might not want to cut it back very much. But in our area, this one is not terribly tall, but they do get too tall. So I'm going to shorten this quite a lot. I have sterilized my clipper with uh, Lysol spray in case there were any bacterial crown gall or anything else of that sort. These plants are on Fortuniana rootstock, and while Fortuniana makes a really wonderful root system for Florida soils, it's not very physically strong, and so the plants have a tendency to blow over, and because of that you have to keep them staked for the life of the plant. Well, this time of year, a lot of our plants, the uh, stake has come loose and the plant has bent over. So the first thing I'm going to do is straighten this up and retie it to its stake. There is some wisdom in wearing gloves when you do this kind of thing. So, so that would put the plant straight up, right like that. And I want to prune this plant to be symmetrical in the position that I want it to end up in. So the first thing I need to do is stake it. So that's nice and vertical. Um, we're using a plastic covered aluminum stake. I'm tying it with a couple strands of jute cord. And so now this plant is already reasonably well shaped. What I want to do is cut back to dormant buds. And I'm going to take it back to a little under knee high. That would be considered short in a lot of parts of the world, but for here, that's reasonable, simply because we get such vigorous growth throughout the year. I'm also going to take out the older, smaller, thinner, more twiggy growth to try to keep the strong, uh, healthy stuff. I am making each cut just above a good dormant bud where I know it will sprout out nicely. I'm also going to try to keep it from trespassing on its neighbors. reason I don't think I need any of this. If this were not next to another bush, I might keep this paint. But as it is, I'm going to remove it.
Okay, I'm going to consider this bush pretty much finished. Um, you can see kind of the ultimate shape there and the fact that the center is nice and open. It makes kind of a bowl around it. I don't have a lot here on our left, but that's facing another bush, so I'm not too concerned about that. Individual cuts have been made at a slant above a good dormant bud. I don't know if that's focusing there or not, hopefully. And I think I like that bush as it is. This monster is an old tea rose. Um, we don't know for sure its original name, but it was named by its finder as Bassus tea because it came from Bassus in France. The older tea roses are um, very well adapted to Florida. They, they like it here, they grow well, they bloom well. They're somewhat more disease resistant than the hybrid teas in general. They tend to make these very large bushes and they don't appreciate being pruned too hard. So compared to the hybrid tea, I'm gonna do less cutting on this one. I'm still gonna remove a lot of that bush because I need to get it down less than head high, but I'm gonna end up with a much larger bush than I would have had if it were a hybrid tea. Again, this plant is grafted to Fortuniana, so it does have a trunk under there. If you grow your roses on their own roots, they may not have a single trunk like that. This one does. And I don't know if you can see very well, but going off to the right, kind of under the mulch, there's a big limb that has headed out that way. I need to get rid of that. So I'm gonna use a saw to do that. Again, I've sprayed it down with um, disinfectant. Make a sizable rose bush on its own, right? That was probably a third of the entire bush, but it was just in the wrong place. Now I'm back to my Felco clippers, which I have again sterilized by spraying them with Lysol spray. Um, on a big bush like this, uh, even if I were wearing good gloves, there's always the danger of shedding blood. And so um, there's nothing wrong with just kind of hacking into it to open up some space. And then you can go in after that and correct your messy cuts. So I'm gonna do a bit of that. One of the things I want to do on this bush is to get it out of the um, walkways in this garden. I need to keep it inside the bed so it doesn't grab passersby. I'm trying to get rid of branches that are crossing over each other. And Tea roses have a tendency to make a lot of little twiggy stuff. It's just not very useful this time of year. So I'm gonna get rid of those and keep the things that are probably finger thick or thicker. If this were a much younger bush that didn't have a lot of big canes, I might leave some of that twiggy stuff there. But on a bush this size, I don't need it. got kind of a window opening up here. That's going to give me a lot more room to work.
apologize that you're seeing so much of my back. I can't seem to aim the camera any better. In different years, I might have had a live cameraman moving around and aiming this better, but this is February uh, 2021, so we're at the height of the COVID pandemic, and um, I don't have a cameraman. I, I would have to be wearing a mask if I had another person nearby, so I figured it was better to do it without a cameraman, with a tripod, without a mask, than to try it with a live person with a mask. I will undoubtedly edit some of this out because this is going to take a while and you're probably there will be long periods of time where you're not seeing anything useful. Now that I can get into this bush without being stabbed, I can start working toward making a nicely shaped top um, working kind of from the bottom up. some of the same philosophy that we use for hybrid tees. I'm going to try to make this more or less a vase shape, make it nicely symmetrical. I'm trying to get rid of any branches that cross over each other by removing the less desirable of the two crossovers. Um, but I'm going to leave a lot more plant than I would on hybrid tees. Now, I'm rather liking the symmetry of this thing. Just thinking about what else may need to come off. I've ended up removing all of the leaves. If it's convenient, I will do that. That certainly cuts back on black spot for a while. Um, but if it's a plant that has just hundreds and hundreds of leaves after I've pruned it, I usually don't bother to take the time to do that. This garden is sprayed for black spot regularly, so it's not really all that beneficial, I guess, to um, completely defoliate this time of year. So this is pretty well done. I'm fairly happy with that. It is uh, fairly globular with a fairly open center. Um, we can get where you can see that. And um, let me get in closer here. The buds near the top are aimed so that they will not send a cane out immediately over the walkway. They're, I don't want them to go back in on, on each other, but I also don't want this plant to um, immediately trespass on the walkway. It will eventually, of course. There's no way around that. And we'll prune those off when the time comes. So this looks pretty good. I think I'm happy with it. I have a few extra slides here that did not appear on the YouTube video, but I thought they might be useful. This is a diagram of kind of how a hybrid tea grows, and really most roses grow pretty much this way. So as a growth flush comes out on a new branch, you get a bunch of buds along that stem. And generally when it first starts, it will often make, hope you can see my cursor here. It'll often make a bud that has either nothing or just a little flap there on it, not really a leaf. 
and then it may make a one leafleted leaf, and then it may make a three leaflet, but then it'll increase. And in the middle of that stem, you're going to get, in most cases, five leaflets. Some things will produce seven. Uh, a few of the old roses will even make more than that. But you'll have an area that has the maximum number of leaflets. And then as it's getting ready to flower, it will decrease the leaflet number again. So the area there that's highlighted would be the best place to make your cuts that will give you the biggest, thickest new stems. Um, I, the way I've got this drawn, there are three of them there. If it's a nice, healthy cane, it may have seven or eight of those ideal buds. But what I'm choosing them for is the fact that they have the maximum number of leaflets on them. One of the things that I find that beginning pruners often don't understand is how short you can cut a cane. Um, let's say it doesn't have any leaves on it where you want to cut. How do you know which bud had the most leaflets? And if you cut it too short, that's referred to as a nub. I'm not sure where that term comes came from. I don't think I created it. I might have learned it from Dr. Bravat or somewhere else back when I learned how to prune roses. But I like to um, use what I call the little finger rule. My little finger is right at two and a half inches long. And I don't like to cut a side cane any shorter than that. So if we look at our diagram here, when it had leaves, we're going to want to cut up in this area. And so if all the leaves are missing, I need to avoid this area, even though I can't see what kind of leaves it has. So here's a cane that I'd like to shorten. This happens to be near my hall. You can see quite a lot of chili thrips injury there. But we've got a bunch of buds all along here. My little finger comes up to about there, I believe. I, I thought I got a picture with the finger in it, but I didn't. So that bud right there would be just fine to cut at. So with that one, when we get down to this one, that's getting a little short, and I would rather not use that. Although if I need a bud to send a branch back in that direction, I might use that one. This one is definitely not a good bud to cut to, and you'll see so many people leaving nubs like that on a cane. Yeah, they'll grow out, but what you're going to get is weak growth. Uh, it'll be thin. The flower it makes, if it may not flower at all. If it does, the flower will be smaller than you'd like. It's just going to be inferior. And then a lot of people will cut with just this little bump sticking up. And that's the worst possible place to cut. Again, there are some dormant buds in this little area here. Hope you can see my cursor. But if they sprout out at all, you're just going to get little wimpy growth that's not going to do you any good. So this got overexposed, but this is a picture of one that's cut that way. And I find after our big pruning day on campus, we get maybe 30 or 40 people to come, most of whom make good cuts, but I always end up finding quite a lot of these. And then we have to correct those by usually cutting them the whole way off and then going to, say, this bud here or the bud below that um, to try to correct the situation. Now go ahead. So that leaves much too long of a nub. Go ahead now and correct that. But hold it, hold your clipper like you just did. So that's a nice cut, except notice that the clipper is upside down. So had he flipped that around, go ahead and flip it. Now the blade is on the side facing, make another little cut there. You'll get a cleaner cut doing it this way with the, the blade on the left, which is where the root system is. So let's prune down to this, this cane correctly, the next, the next bud down. Well, I guess it would be that one. And you'll want to get, yeah, get your angle right. Yeah, that's pretty good. So on this cane, we've got a leaf here with a bud. Here we have another bud where the leaf's fallen off. But in between is a prickle. And some people will prune to that prickle. Ouch. It's a sharp one too. But there's nothing there to grow. It, it's going to grow from there. So ignore where the prickle is and prune for the, the bud that you want. Again, you would not prune above there. You would prune above there. The uh, video 
covered hybrid teas and teas. Just thinking of some of the other common old roses that we grow in our area, uh, the true chinas, things like Louis Philippe and Old Blush, couldn't care less what you do with them. You can just hack them back what, however you want, and they'll be just fine. As it says here, some people even use a hedge trimmer. Bourbons like um, Souvenir de la Malmaison, uh, I would cut very much just like a hybrid tea. They may have slightly thinner canes, but uh, proportionally, you're going to trim them the same way. And the same is true of hybrid perpetuals. They're often like very big, hefty hybrid teas. And so I cut them back pretty severely. Um, some of them, like Baron Prévost, make way too many canes. And so it's also good to thin those out, taking out the weaker or older ones and just keeping those really strong young canes that were fairly recently uh, basal breaks. Then if you're climbing roses, um, and I'm assuming here these are repeat flowering, I don't grow any once flowering climbers. If you do grow a once flowering climber, it's best not to prune it till after it blooms and then prune it however you like for the next year. Um, but for the rebloomers, um, train them onto whatever climbing structure you have them on. But you get your best blooms from the branches that hang horizontally or even below horizontal. Um, there are a few of the hybrid musks, for example, that uh, really do better if they're almost water falling or, or something like Peggy Martin flowers best on those low hanging branches, branches that go up the trellis and then hang back down. You'll get great flowers on those. The shrub form noisettes like blush noisette or Chamonix pink cluster, we prune just like a hybrid tea. But again, like the bourbons, they may have somewhat thinner woods, so you just have to kind of prune proportionally depending on what you've got. And then modern shrubs like Melinda's Dream and most of the Austins, you could treat those just like hybrid teas if you'd like. <laughs> 